Today we're going to continue looking at our what we started last week. Three of the most important questions that all Christians should know. Now that's a pretty hefty title for uh, you know this is a pretty good resume for these questions. You could probably argue that there are other questions that we need to know the answers to, and you'd be right. But these are some of the three most foundational questions that I think all Christians should be able to answer in one form or another, especially if we're going to share our faith with others. Why do I need Jesus? That's number one. Why do I need the church? And why do I need this church? You know, with 17 plus churches in town, why do I need this one? So last week we talked about why we need Jesus, and we, we said that Jesus saves us from sin. Jesus saves us from death. Jesus acts as a guide in our lives, and Jesus invites us in a project of renewal, renewing people, renewing creation. So that's all well and good, but some people might say, well, I can do that without the church. Why do I need the church in order to follow Jesus? I, can, I don't need the church to do that. Now, for those who grew up in the church, for those of you who never had a moment of disillusionment with the church, maybe you grew up and you always felt welcome, you always felt part of the community, part of the family, you might wonder what the big deal is. But for a lot of people, they have either been betrayed by, felt disillusioned by uh, the church, and or felt unwelcome. Uh, perhaps they experienced what oftentimes we see in the news. Uh, a scandal or a hypocrisy. You know, when we see kind of like drawing back the curtain in the Wizard of Oz and we find out that things are not what they seem. Uh, many people have experienced that firsthand, maybe on a grand scale or maybe just with another person within the church and they felt hurt or disillusioned. And so they didn't feel like they could go anymore. Or perhaps it's not something that drastic, but for some people, it's just that they don't really feel welcome or they don't feel a part of the community. And so maybe, you know, it's not that people are outwardly mean to them, but they just feel ignored other than some social niceties uh, when they come in. Uh, but in general, people are weary and are suspicious of institutions of all kinds, not just church but institutions of all kinds, and that includes the church. And for some people, they feel the church is just irrelevant. You know, they've gone to church before, the services are boring, the sermon is hard to follow and doesn't really connect with anything that they're dealing with in life. And so, you know, pardon them if they feel that they're too busy to be able to take time out of their day to go to a uh, church service that they don't really get anything out of. And now we could argue again, we could retort, well, it's not about you and what you get out of it. But that would be partially true. <laughs> not just partially true, right? Most people would admit that if they weren't getting anything out of church, they would eventually fall away. <clears throat> so let's look a little bit at why we need the church. Why the church is important to, as we seek to follow Christ rather than just doing it on our own. First of all, what do we, when we think of church, the first thing we think of is, after we think of a building, you know, we usually think of worship. Because worship is the main event, the thing that everything else revolves around, is the worship service or services. And the reason why we call them a service is because it's something we're doing for God. It is a service for God. And so, and so in that respect, it's true that we don't come to church just for what we get out of it. It's what we're giving to God. Worship goes back to the very beginning of human history. In the very beginning, in ancient times, people would worship the gods primarily not out of love, but primarily out of desperation. And so the idea was that if you had a drought that you wanted to end, or if you had too much rain that you wanted to end, or if you, if you had um, a, a sickness that you wanted healed, or if you had a battle and you wanted to turn the tide in the battle, you would get on your knees and worship, right? This was not an act of love. This was an act of please. This was an, an act of begging God, the gods to do something. And if you make the gods happy enough, maybe they will do what you need them to do. Well, funny how sometimes we take that same line of thinking still today in our worship. We all do it to some extent. If I do this, then God will be happy with me, and then something good will happen in my life. It's the same 
thought process, but of course back then things were very different. The, uh, the focal point of worship was the offering. And when I talk about offering, I'm talking about human sacrifice or animal sacrifice. Right? And we're like, whoa, you know, we think of money when we think of offering, but in ancient times it was human sacrifice, animal sacrifice. Now in the Jewish faith, they pretty much by and large did away with human sacrifice. I say they by and large because in the Old Testament you can read some instances where some people actually engaged in that human sacrifice. Uh, there's actually a valley outside of the city of Jerusalem uh, called Gehenna. Uh, many of us uh, uh, today, people kind of associate that with the traditional view of what we think of as hell. And there's a good reason for that. It's because the valley of Gehenna is where uh, some of the kings practiced human sacrifice. People would pass through the fire, so to speak. And this was a place that was just always burning. You know, and so you get that mental image of God's judgment. Uh, but by and large, people did not practice human sacrifice, and it was always condemned in the scripture as being one of the worst sins. But in ancient, ancient times, that's what they thought they had to do to please God. Then, in the Jewish faith, they largely put a stop to that, and they, they did animal sacrifice. But then that eventually came to an end too. And you may wonder, well, why don't they do that anymore? Well, the reason why is because they don't have a temple, right? See, what happened is they eventually came to live in exile in Babylon, and they lost everything. They lost their temple. They lost the land that they lived in. And these two things were foundational to their faith, the temple and the land. What do we do? You know, they would have to wonder, what are we going to do to preserve our culture? You know, think about this. If, if for some reason some, some people came and attacked America and somehow won and all of us were taken to live in exile in another country, we don't have the land. We don't have the traditional landmarks that we think of. You know, what do we do to preserve our culture? That's what they were going through. What do we do to preserve our culture? What, what does this mean for our faith and our religion? And this is the time period when the scriptures started to be uh, edited, compiled, put together in its final form that we see much of the Old Testament in its final form during this time because they wanted to preserve their story and their history as to who they were as a people and why they were in exile. And so... They, they, their worship started to focus more on the reading and teaching of those writings. And then when they came back from exile, they rebuilt a temple, they had animal sacrifices still, but they still, they would have these synagogues, these buildings where they would meet and they wouldn't necessarily have sacrifices, but it would focus more on the teaching of the scripture. And then of course, when the temple was destroyed again, never to be rebuilt, that's when it was ended. But through time, we've seen the worship has come to mean more than just begging God for something, right? I mean, we all do that from time to time. But worship has become more of a, of a, a thanksgiving. And we see that in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We see that worship is a thanksgiving to God for all that God has done. For God being with us, for all that God is and has done in our lives. It is like a thank you note to God in which we say, God, thank you. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for leading me, guiding me in spite of who I am sometimes, in spite of what I have done. Thank you for how much you love me. And uh, so worship is our thank you to God. So in that respect, worship is really not about us. It's about God and what we can do for God. But as I said, that, that statement is partially true because church is also about what we get out of it. And so hopefully in worship, we can connect with God. And we can, we can be inspired to grow in our faith. Now, it's not going to happen necessarily every weekend or with every song. Uh, there may be a song, uh, you know, that you think of. Maybe last week we sung a hymn or something, and you thought, think to yourself, I'll be happy if we don't ever sing that one again. <laughs> None of you think that, right? But, I mean, you know, there might be a certain song that you sing. Maybe it's the praise song. But, but there might be a song that you, you sing and you think, oh, my goodness. You know, uh, this just does nothing for me. And that might be, it might not do anything for you, but you never know. It might be that for your neighbor, it's helping your neighbor connect with God in a very real way. And so, you know, that's why we include different kinds of music is because different kinds of things help us to connect with God. And so hopefully, 
uh, during worship, at certain times we can connect with God in one form or another. And then another thing that we can do in worship is we can learn. We can grow. And that's kind of the sermon, which has kind of become the focal point of worship, especially in Protestant churches, is uh, the sermon. You know, in, in uh, Catholic churches, it's still mostly on the offering, which is uh, communion. And in a way, communion is the offering, the offering of Jesus Christ. Uh, for us, it's the sermon, and it's in the sermon that we learn and we grow and we, we learn about what it means to follow Jesus. So that's one thing church is for, worship. We are able to connect with God. We are able to learn about Jesus. We are able to uh, be inspired to continue to grow. Some people could retort back and say, I can worship God when I'm fishing. Yes, you can. You can worship God anywhere. You can be in a worshipful attitude anywhere that you are. But there are certain times and places where that are more conducive to helping us to connect with God. Nature can be one of them. But worshiping together in a community of faith is another. And it's just that it may be that for some people, you know, if they go to church and they haven't experienced that for so long, it might be hard to convince them. So, but that's one reason why we need church is we connect with God. Another reason we need church is that we grow in our faith. Through small group and fellowship event activities, we get connected to one another and build relationships. And then we also learn. We grow in our faith through studies and, and things like that. Where we Things like what we're starting next, next week on Sunday night. And these are opportunities for us to learn, okay, how do I follow Jesus? What does it mean to follow Jesus? And, you know, small group studies and things like that, they're not an end in and of themselves. You know, it's not just we go to small groups because that's important. We, we study because that's important. No, hopefully the point of it is that it will help you to live your life according to the example of Christ when you're not in church. Does that make sense? You learn what it means to follow the example of Jesus. Otherwise, if we're just learning to learn, there is intrinsic value in learning to learn, but the, the idea or the end is to help us to be more like Christ when we're not with each other, right? And when we are with each other, hopefully, but even when we're not with each other. And then the church also gives us opportunities to practice. We have opportunities to practice following, our, following Jesus and living out our faith in ministry opportunities. Whether that be opportunities to serve anywhere from uh, helping out with worship to uh, serving in a ministry at the community kitchen, feed my starving children, food packing event, uh, you know, just the different ministries of the church. And that can help us practice and learn how to love others. And then hopefully, though, it doesn't just stay within the church, but then we take that and we take it with us out into our workplace and into our family life and into our communities so that we are truly being a blessing to our community, not just within the walls of the church. All of that's important, too. But so these a threefold thing, we worship and we connect with God, we grow in our faith as we seek to build relationships with one another, and then we serve others. Those are the three main things that church helps us to do. You know, it's interesting that Jesus, when he started the church movement, you know, he, he, with his disciples, he started this movement called the church. He was aware of the pitfalls. <coughs> you know, the Jewish leaders of his day were corrupt. And yet Jesus started this new movement knowing full well that there would probably be corruption. There would probably be hypocrisy. There would probably be people hurting one another. They would probably be people who are, are not living their best, following Jesus to the best of their ability. He knew that. And yet Jesus felt that it was so important that we learn that following Christ is not an individual activity. We need one another. Salvation and faith is not an individual thing. It's not just, it's not just me and God or me and my Bible. You know, we live in an individualistic culture, and so it seems like it should be. But salvation and faith is a communal activity. Jesus didn't just die for you, he died for the world. And Christ is calling us and saying,
saving us, not just for ourselves, but also for the benefit of the world. And the best way, the best way, not the perfect way, but the best way that we can make a large-scale difference in the world is by pooling our resources, by supporting one another as we seek to make a difference in the world and learn what it means to be like Jesus and to follow Jesus. The best way we can do that is in a community of faith, as imperfect as it may be. And so that's why Jesus felt that it was so important to start it, because he wants us to be together, and we need the church. We need the church, not just the Methodist church, but we need all the churches. We need all the different varieties of church faith and traditions around the world, from uh, Presbyterian to Baptist to Assembly of God to, uh, to I'm not going to list them all, otherwise I'm going to leave someone out, but uh, the, the Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, we need all of these traditions to inform us and to help us, because let me tell you something. As we're going to look at in our next sermon series, too, this book is really hard to understand. I don't know if you've noticed that. <laughs> there are parts of it that are, that are easier than others to understand, but this book is really hard to understand and to know how to read it, and, and so it's very difficult. So well, we need one another to help us to understand what is God calling us to do? What? Who is God? What is God like? And what is God calling us to do? And so Jesus calls us to do that with one another. Not just on our own, but with one another. And in so doing, we can work together and be a force for good in the world. That others may see Jesus and may be transformed. And so like last week when I talked about this, if you're ever in some kind of a conversation where this topic comes up of, well, I, you know, I don't, I don't need the church. And they may have some really good reasons why they're right. And there may be some people who really need a break from the church. You won't hear the pastor say that very often. But there are some people who really need a break from the church. If they've been hurt, if they felt betrayed, if, you know, something like, you know, if they've been hurt in some way, then they may need a break. Some people just need a break because they've been giving their all for a long time, and they need a break, and they need to step back. And so people may have valid reasons why they don't feel like they need the church. But if that topic ever comes up, like with the first question, I said that, you know, rather than telling somebody else why they need Jesus, because <laughs> that's condescending, you can say, well, here's why I need Jesus. Here's why, why I think Jesus is important to me. And then that can help people to start thinking. And in the same way, rather than telling somebody else why they need church or why they should go to church, uh, because, again, there's no way to say that without an element of shame. You know, I mean, even if you're not meaning to do that, it's like, oh, I'm not meaning to make them feel shameful. It's hard to say why somebody else should do something that they're not doing without making them feel bad. And so the best way to talk about this is, again, to turn it to yourself. Well, you know, I uh, go to this church, and, and here's why I feel like it's important in my life. Here's what it does for me. Here's what it adds to my life. And then you're not putting them on the spot, but you're saying, well, this is what it means to me. You know, this is where I find my community, or this is where I, I connect with God, or this is how I learn more about my faith, or this is where I get the opportunity to serve. And, uh, and it might be something else that I haven't even mentioned today, but I would encourage you to start with yourself. I know we don't usually say that, we usually say think of others, but with these questions, think of yourself. Why do I feel the church is important for me? And that might help get them to thinking, well, maybe... Maybe the church could be important. And for those that are taking a break from church because they've been disheartened or hurt, uh, a key thing to do is to have compassion on them and have patience. And to realize that it might take time. And they might need to take time. And to be patient with them. Yeah, but don't give up on them either. I mean, don't pester them. That's not what I'm saying. But, but every 
every every now and then we might, you know, give an invitation every you know about a half a year later or two months later or whatever you feel you know the person better than I do. But uh, be patient and realize that sometimes people need to be away if uh, they've had a ne negative experience. And in the meantime, too, we as a church can learn from that. If there are people who have negative experiences, we can hopefully learn what happened. What, what, what happened? Is there something that we need to do? Is there something we need to apologize for? Because there could be. But in all things, we want to seek to show the love of Christ to people. And one of the ways that we do that is by showing compassion to those who don't feel like they need the church for one reason or another. And then to share with them if that conversation comes up, well, here's why I feel like I need the church. Here's why it's important to me. Here's why I feel like I can't do this Jesus thing alone. <laughs> why I need help. And why the church helps me in, the, in that journey. And then they might see, yeah, maybe there is something that I need in the church. And maybe the Spirit of God may be working in them and may one day lead them to either return if they've been away for a while or to come for the first time. But trust in the work of the Holy Spirit in a person's life too. And don't feel as though it's all on you. But we need the church we, because we need one another. We're all different. We need one another. Just like these tools, you know. Just like these tools are all different, we need them for different things in the same way. We need the church because we can't do it on our own any more than you could build a house with just a hammer and a wall. We need one another to help us as we seek to grow in our faith and emulate Christ 